Hello! Our story begins inside of Padme's family villa on the beautiful countryside of Naboo. The Clone Wars had just begun, and they were sitting in her living room talking to each other. They had their own desires and feelings, both of which were very, very mutual. Within the span of a week, they realized they were in love. Despite this fiery love they had, the two of them needed to make an important decision. There was a war raging in the galaxy. Anakin was a Jedi, and Padme was a Senator which doesn't work because Jedi have Jedi parts and Senators have Senator parts. But seriously, it doesn't work because as a Jedi, Anakin was forbidden from having attachments. He wouldn't be allowed to be in a relationship with her openly. It could cause more discourse around them that they didn't want. It was bad enough a former Jedi was leading the Separatist movement. Anakin and Padme didn't want the attention. But there was still the lingering question, what would become of them? They did truly love each other, despite the short period between seeing each other again and now. So what were they to do? Act like they didn't have such feelings for each other? Surely not. Anakin wouldn't be able to do that. Even if their relationship was in private, they could make it work. Padme was right though. Living the life of a lie would destroy both of them, especially in such a period of high stress. Did he really want to fight a war and worry about the political side of that war? Did he want to have that burning thought in the back of his head every time he was on the front lines that she could be dead? Realistically, he would think about that regardless of what they decided here and now. She understood, as she was saying the words, she realized that ever since they were assigned to each other, things wouldn't ever be the same again. They wouldn't be able to just go back to living the life they had before this. Sure, Anakin had his crush on her for the years until they met up again, but Padme now had to continue contributing to the Republic while holding such heavy feelings. The two of them sat in silence, before returning to each other in an uplifted spirit. They had been brainstorming for hours, Anakin would have to return to the temple the following day, and they were trying to figure out how they would justify continuing this private relationship, or if they would cut the time. Anakin would say a couple words and then backtrack, Padme would follow up, doing the same, before falling back on her own words. Each of them kept trying to find a way for this to logistically work without tearing them apart. Anakin then had an idea. Like a lightning bolt, he jumped up and grabbed her hands. She looked at him with excitement. This had to be good. And he told her that they didn't have to get married now. He got down in front of her, looking into her eyes from her level. Anakin asked her if she loved him, and she smiled, saying that of course she did. Padme leaned up towards him and asked what he was planning. His smile widened, and he told her that they could still love each other from afar. They could continue fighting this stupid war, he on the front lines and she on the pedestals of the Senate. Her smile widened too. She looked at him with an excited expression. That could work. He said that it could take the burden away from their secret relationship, and they could interact with each other as friends, or, you know, friends. They could have a couple movie nights or game nights or whatever, whenever they had time around each other, and then they could go back to being where they were. Truthfully, it sounded like a situationship. But what situationship wasn't two people madly in love acting like they weren't? Plus, it'd be super beneficial for Skywalker because he wouldn't get in trouble for having attachments. While the Jedi forbid such attachments, those rules didn't necessarily apply to everything else. So if they were caught, frolicking around, he could just deny it, and that wouldn't be that big of a deal. Ironically, this could work in the scenario which they got married, but there was just an extra burden with slapping such a hefty title on a secret relationship. The two of them loved this idea. They'd be able to enjoy each other's company for the rest of the night, before Anakin returned to Coruscant with R2. Padme would keep 3PO and return to the capital within the coming week. Upon Anakin's return to Coruscant, he would be knighted, which he was kind of surprised by. Obi-Wan had plenty of reason to hold him back, especially after their duel with Dooku, but apparently the council helped Obi-Wan find his faith in Anakin again. Windu was the one who even suggested that he believed Skywalker was ready for knighthood. The council had their hopes for Anakin, and so he was knighted and the war began. The beginning of the war was chaotic, back and forth between fleets and armies, going from planet to planet, losing and winning battle after battle. There never was a straight line, and for the Republic, losing was the name of their game in the beginning. This gifted the Chancellor more emergency powers, and the Divide helped create a neutral systems coalition. While Anakin did miss Padme without being tied to her, the two of them kept their distance. They agreed on it too. It'd be simply easier for them to remain in love but stay apart. This wasn't because either of them was searching for someone new, but it was just so they didn't have the burden of being there for each other all the time. 
it did take stress off of both of them, but Anakin soon realized this detachment would affect him in almost a negative way. Having lost his mother not long before and not being married to Padme meant he couldn't have a clear line of communication with someone super close to him. In the temple, he had Obi-Wan from time to time, not for everything, but for a good number of things. And yes, Anakin had Rex and Ahsoka, but there were some emotions Anakin wasn't exactly wanting to share with his clone captain or his Padawan. He was overjoyed to have Ahsoka in his life at this point, but he didn't want a trauma dump onto her. With Rex, it was just that their bond was still growing. They could relate to everything going on around them, but there were other topics that someone like Rex wouldn't be able to understand. It wasn't the fact that he wouldn't try to understand. Anakin knew Rex was a good man and all, but he didn't have any experience outside of Kamino. There wasn't much they could talk about that Rex could understand with relationships. Anakin was definitely underestimating his clone captain here, but it wasn't ill-intentioned. He just wasn't sure how to explain some of his emotions around everything to someone who grew up with millions of brothers. Obi-Wan was around from time to time, but Anakin never liked talking about this kind of stuff with him, and so he was kind of stuck. Skywalker had a yearning to connect with someone that was either around his age or older. The loss of his mother really affected this, especially early into the war. Anakin held himself up though. The main reason he did this is because with the Padawan, he had to. He couldn't be down on himself and tearing himself apart, not when he had a student reliant on his strength. Initially, the trial of war would lead to success. Anakin found strength with his men, on the front lines. His unit very quickly became one of the most elite units and successful units of clones in the Grand Army of the Republic. They were able to rip through droid forces, and they were able to dominate fleet battles. Their usage of unorthodox plans allowed them to make a good use of what little they had. Initially, Anakin was given three Venators, which was fine, but the war demanded he need more. As his unit proved to be successful, he was gifted more units to work with. On the other side of his wartime success, he had very little encounters with Padme. There was once when they stopped off at Coruscant for a rotation. Ahsoka went to the temple, Anakin went to Padme. It was a moment of realization for him. He lacked having someone that he could be his truest self around. Skywalker struggled with his vulnerability. Being pulled away from his mother at age 9 was a dent on his mentality, not to mention the whole no attachment rule that the Jedi had. So for him to finally have someone like Padme that he could be himself around was relieving, but the burden of such relief is what followed. Because while he was able to relax for a period and lower his guard around her for a good number of hours, his guard was raised once more when he returned to the fleet. He was no longer Annie. He was General Anakin Skywalker of the Grand Army of the Republic. Internally, he realized that perhaps this was the way things needed to be. He needed to win the war so he could enjoy the pleasantries of life on the other side. Though part of him started to wonder, was his infatuation with Padme solely due to she being the first connection with anyone he had aside from Obi-Wan since he left his mother behind? This obviously didn't have to be a romantic connection, but it was a valid question. Had Anakin experienced such a connection with any of the other girls in his class before Genosis, would he have fallen for them the same way? Anakin was curious. He wanted to figure it out, because despite his true love and adoration for Padme, the galaxy was huge. There were quadrillions upon quadrillions upon whatever the next bigger number is in the galaxy. It just kept on going. For instance, there were four quadrillion people on Coruscant alone. That was more than entire star systems. So the question remained, did he have an infatuation for her because she was the first person he had any type of deeper connection with? He wanted to test that theory out, but he also was a bit afraid to. Despite the agreements he made with Padme, he felt that seeking out would be cheating. But firstly, they weren't in a relationship, and secondly, there was nothing wrong with having friends that were also women. So those early fears and anxieties dissipated pretty quickly. Also, Anakin had no clue where he'd have the chance to find such a connection. He thought of all the places he could go to find new friends. These new friends, of course, didn't need to be women but Anakin was lacking that in his life. Yes, Ahsoka was there, but she was a student. He was teaching her. Anakin yearned for the recovery of the bond he was now craving, unlike anything else. Being around Padme was intoxicating for him. He just wanted to be around her more and more, but he couldn't be, not until the war ended. He did want to call her, however, they agreed that they would call once a month or every couple months. They could not do it frequently. She knew this would happen, having had previous relationships before Anakin. Padme still had no question in her mind about loving him, 
but because she was able to handle her emotions maturely, she had very little issue with this. She found outlets to talk to and express herself to. This helped her handle everything well, where Anakin wasn't able to. Due to Anakin wanting to test out this theory, he tried to see if he felt the same warm, fuzzy feelings he felt with Padme when he was paired up with the Jedi Commander. She was a Jedi Knight, like him, a year younger, and she was commanding a small division on an outpost. He was there simply for support. As he realized through this encounter, he wasn't trying to find love. While yes, there was still the allure, especially with the particular individual he was with, he didn't want to start all over again. He was desperately searching for a strong emotional connection, one that did not require romantic love. And yes, Notabre was great company while he was at this outpost, but he just kind of left it up to what if, or maybe in another life. The connection was there, but he didn't want to chase. His time with Notabre helped him really understand himself, and he would finally be able to connect the dots where he least expected to. Skywalker and Kenobi were assigned to escort the Duchess of Mandalore to Coruscant. It would be here where Anakin asked Obi-Wan if he could shadow Satine during the day. Obi-Wan was curious as to why, and Anakin explained half a truth, or simply part of the truth, so that he knew what Anakin was seeking or thinking. Obi-Wan really respected the honesty and dedication from his student. It was admirable. Obi-Wan would tell Satine what little he knew, and she welcomed it with open arms. She of course wouldn't mind having Anakin around her. She was a bit busy with the delegates, but once they finished their debates and such, it'd be smooth sailing. Before they got to that part, there was an assassination attempt, but it was foiled while they were in hyperspace. Anakin would have a couple hours to be around Satine. She wasn't a big sleeper anyways, so she didn't mind staying up those couple hours. The two of them spoke like friends for the remainder of the trip to Coruscant. They didn't eat anything, but she got an understanding of what Obi-Wan was referencing. Anakin told his master that he realized he was lacking emotional connections, and he was desperately looking for them. Obi-Wan correctly assumed when he asked Anakin if it was because of his mother dying. That's why Kenobi was especially pushing for Anakin to be around Satine. She may have not been a mother, but the fact that she was Obi-Wan's age would make her something closer to what Anakin saw Obi-Wan as. Skywalker had told Padme that he saw Obi-Wan like a father figure, and Kenobi kind of knew that so he used that as his frame for reference when he informed Satine about this little development. Their little talk with each other never got anywhere deep, more so just surface level stuff, but it was nice to talk to Satine for Anakin. She had a much different perspective on everything because she wasn't inside the Republic. Her focus was ending the war, and it added depth to the galaxy for Anakin. He'd be an assistance to her and Obi-Wan over the following few days, as she was almost set up to join the Republic. Palpatine was trying to force Mandalore into the Republic, but she wasn't able to be convinced. Satine refused to leave the Neutral Systems Coalition to join him. Palpatine knew that an issue in the future would be making sure that the Neutral Systems bowed to the Empire. The key to that coalition was Satine. If she joined the Empire or died, then the other systems would crumble nearly instantaneously. He planned to play off of that, but it never really worked out. However, he did take a note of Anakin helping Satine while she was here. Skywalker would opt to take Satine back to Mandalore to make sure she remained safe, and it was agreed upon. Obi-Wan definitely wished she could have been the one to do it, because one of them needed to stay behind, but if it helped Anakin, then he was willing to do it. Kenobi knew that Anakin and Padme had started some sort of relationship, they just never finished it, similar to he and Satine, so if she could be an aide to Anakin, then it'd be worthwhile in his mind. Obi-Wan remembered how much he hurt after he left Satine on Mandalore, and Obi-Wan was in control of his emotions. He knew how difficult that would be for Anakin. This time for Anakin was very nice, actually. He may have not agreed with Satine's stance, but he appreciated her warmness to him. She could also tell, aside from what Obi-Wan said, that he desperately needed a close friend, one that he could share non-Jedi information with. So Satine told him that she was a busy person, but if he ever needed to talk, he could call and she would try and pick up. She could see how tense he had been when they first met, before leaving Mandalore. And as he was leaving Mandalore this time, she could see how relaxed he was. It was like an entirely different person in her eyes. He was calm, collected, warm. There was just a different tone about him. She didn't take all the responsibility for this change, but she knew that her openness to their friendship allowed for him to feel comfortable. Over the coming months, Anakin and Satine would keep in contact with each other. They were becoming good friends, and the age difference made Anakin see her almost like a mother. Now, he wasn't calling her old, but she was like 16 or so years older than him. Anakin knew he needed a friend, 
but this connection with a maternal figure really put everything else into perspective for him. This new relationship would continue on for months, actually going on long enough that Palpatine began to notice. He figured it out because of the few times he interacted with Anakin, and him having mentioned his new friendship with Satine. He didn't fear her, but Palpatine feared her influence. She was one of the great political minds of their generation, a mind that could very easily sway Anakin away from his control. Palpatine tried alternative means to get Skywalker to side more with him, but because Satine made herself so available for contact, Anakin didn't need what Palpatine was trying to offer. He had the connection he desired, so Palpatine turned to his old reliable ally. His timing was terrible. In an effort to kill two birds with one invasion fleet, Sidious requested that Dooku lead a military force to Mandalore to kill Duchess Satine and rip apart the foundation of the Neutral Systems Coalition. The evasion itself wasn't the issue. The issue was the fact that Anakin and Ahsoka were on the way to Mandalore because Satine was starting an investigation into a string of sicknesses within her school systems. Ahsoka was going to be leading that investigation, but by Jedi protocol, Anakin was taking Ahsoka to the planet. Plus, he wanted to see his friend again, in person. As they arrived, alarms started blaring overhead. Just as the Jedi landed, a CAS invasion fleet arrived at a hyperspace. Anakin turned to R2, who beeped at him, telling him that their comms were blocked. Skywalker turned to his student, and put his hand on her shoulders, and he asked if he could trust her. She nodded her head. He told her to take their ship, get out of the system, and call for help. She didn't want to, but he was very adamant. A lot of people were going to die if she didn't. He would stay here and defend the ground. Ahsoka reluctantly ran into the ship and lifted off, abandoning Mandalore. Skywalker turned around and asked Satine what forces she had. She was very quick on her feet. Despite the past of his lifestyle, she grew up in a time of war. She knew how to handle these situations. Satine ran over towards the door panel and plugged in a couple codes. She told Anakin that the security unit would be here soon. Anakin turned back and saw a couple of CIS transports preparing to land on the planet. Dooku would have preferred glassing Sundari, but Skywalker was down there, and he was ordered to capture him. It'd be a good way to push Anakin further down his path. Obviously, Satine was to be executed. Anakin switched right back into General Skywalker and asked permission to give out orders, considering they were Satine's units as it was. She was fine with it, as she made sure all the people evacuated from the surface of the planet and the city. The underground tunnels would be safe for them. Anakin didn't know about those, but her calmness regarding her people told him that Sundari was prepared for an assault like this. Anakin rounded up more units. Most of these men and women were elite guards who protected the palace and police units. They could still fight, but they weren't exactly clone troopers. Anakin knew that, so he prepared traps, designating through the landing docks to be armed with traps immediately. Whatever they had, they had to use it. Anakin then went to his friend and told her to stay safe and far away from everyone else. Skywalker admitted that he didn't trust Olmec before, and he was pushing that narrative again. She was willing to go with it. He told her that he would check in with her when everything was set. Satine and her four best troops would relocate to the palace and use its tunnels to get underground and meet up with the rest of the people. Olmec was escorted elsewhere. On Concordia, Death Watch caught wind of this invasion and decided to prepare all their craft for an assault on Sindari. Within minutes, the droid dropships dropped their troops off at the landing docks and Skywalker called for the bombs to be activated. Each of the vessels were detonated, and the first wave of enemies were dealt with. Skywalker used long-range hollow binoculars to see that it was Dooku's fleet. He found this to be odd, but any chance to kill Dooku was a chance to end the war. As more dropships landed, he continued issuing out orders. Despite the lack of battlefront military training that these troopers had, they had a good general, and that was half the battle. The fact that such a commanding presence stood on the front lines with them held them in high morale. They were ready for anything that came down for them, but when the first wave of B2 battle droids started marching from the dropships, they realized what absolute menaces these monsters were. Anakin moved to the front line, deflecting and parrying any blaster shots that came his way. He then noted that Dooku's solar sailor was also making his way down. He needed time to solo on Dooku, and if they could buy time for the clones to arrive, then they could win this thing. Anakin told the last unit of troopers to booby trap the entrances into Sundari. They needed to be ready, so that once the front line retreated, they could get back and hold the line even longer. Their main objective was stalling. Blaster fire continued to cover the landing zone until Skywalker pushed his troops back into the tunnel, the one that led to the city. Each of them funneled in before him. As Skywalker turned to run, he could see Dooku exit the ship with an insidious grin. He would pay for all of this. Skywalker ran back, and the doors shut. 
Before Dooku could order his droids forward, a bundle of Mandalorian ships came flying by. They said they were allies of Dooku, which is the only reason why the tactical droid in orbit allowed them to pass. Dooku turned back and raised his hand, giving a slight signal that the droids would follow. The ship doors opened and Pre Vizsla walked out with Death Watch at stone. He asked Dooku why he didn't invite him to the burning of Satine's glorified kingdom. Dooku apologized for his insolence and pointed ahead, suggesting that he could be his guest. Vizsla told his troopers to prepare for a breach as he stood side by side with Dooku. He asked what encouraged the CIS invasion of Mandalore. Dooku wasn't much for chit chat, so Pre suggested that he make a fine mayor or governor under Dooku's wise leadership. The Count laughed, and he agreed, suggesting that they should make it formal. He told Pre to bow so that he could receive a knighting, like they did on Sereno. Pre found this to be a little bit odd, but why would he complain? Mandalore would be his. He just had to play this little game, and then succeed once the war was over. Pre bowed his head, and Dooku whipped his lightsaber out of his pocket before he beat down it again. Vizsla fell to the ground lifelessly with a head rolling over, and Dooku's other hand dropped. The Mandalorians were ambushed and killed. After the execution of Death Watch, Dooku's droid forces pushed forward, before being crushed in an explosion that obliterated the tunnel into the city. Now they would have to wait. Brilliant. Dooku had no issue with this. The droids could get reinforcements. The Mandalorians were stalling until their inevitable end. After a few hours of hard work, the first droid would break through, and the battle was at full throttle again. Anakin had since barricaded everything he could on the inside. Satine was safe with her guard, and the people inside the city had fully evacuated. With the battle droids funneling in, Skywalker took to the front lines and cut them down. He knew Dooku would come at some point. All he needed to do was stall. The battle was tense. The Mandalorians started falling back, and Skywalker ordered them to the buildings surrounding the entrance to the city. Urban warfare would be their ally. At the same time, he would try and find Dooku and defeat him. They did a firing retreat before barricading their buildings. The droids pushed forward crushing through homes and offices with their wrist rockets. It was a full-scale invasion, and then Anakin saw it. Dooku finally made his way out of the tunnel. Anakin was mostly ineffective during the battle at this point, especially due to the fact that he couldn't fight the droids unless they were in the building with him. But the Mandalorian guard would succeed best with their staves at this point. Skywalker got to the top of a building and leapt off, slamming down in front of Dooku and using the force to crush his two magnet guards. Dooku smiled and called him a foolish boy before lunging forward. Above the atmosphere, Admiral Yularen exited hyperspace and completely blindsided the CIS forces. They were stationed for a siege, and now the Republic was here. He ordered all ships to attack. Ahsoka, on the other hand, finally a combat veteran, led the fighters on an assault of the enemy fleet. Behind her were a number of Republic gunships, escorted by V-19s. It was a very strategically sound attack. The droids wouldn't know what hit them. Inside the city, Anakin could see the Mandalorians fighting with their lives. They were being pushed back again and again. At the same time, he was holding his own with Dooku. Initially, he thought he could do it, but his powers hadn't doubled since the last time they met. Their blades matched the speed and ferocity of their previous engagement. Dooku kept playing with Skywalker's head, taunting him every time they made a strike, even making a remark about killing Satine. That felt odd. Not many people knew about their dynamic, but he wasn't about to lose someone else. Dooku shoved Anakin through a glass window before jumping through and slamming down. From his left side, Skywalker struck. As they were intertwined in their pool, LAATs rained down from the tunnel, blasting the battle droids and pushing through the streets. A rocket from an LAAT clipped the building Anakin and Dooku were in. It was jarring to Dooku because Anakin knew the counter was coming, and Dooku didn't. For the first time in any of their engagements, Anakin could see Dooku rattled so he pressed harder, using every move he had ever learned. In the act of pushing Dooku back, he jabbed before dropping the lightsaber and grabbing it in the other hand. Dooku swung over Anakin's wrist and missed, before he was hit with an elbow and cut down mercilessly. As Anakin stood over Dooku, he received a communication from Ahsoka, informing him that the Separatist fleet was in ruins. They were on the run. Anakin smiled and contacted Satine to let her know they had been saved. And despite the victory, a part of her hurt. She knew that Palpatine would abuse their planet, as he had the rest of the Republic. She hurt for her people. Obviously, she was grateful for the Republic, because without them, they wouldn't have stood a chance. But it was the fact that Palpatine would get his greedy fingers all over her system and potentially the neutral systems coalition. Skywalker would be stationed on Mandalore for the next week to help with the cleanup, as well as informing the Council about Dooku's death. This changed everything for the Council and for the Sith Lord. 
Rebus was still on the loose, and the council even dispatched Windu to Mandalore to personally meet with Anakin. They had a long call, one that carried them through the streets of Sundare. The people were returning to normal life, and Windu informed Skywalker that he had done well, turning to him and informing him that being a Jedi wasn't easy, fighting in a war wasn't their way, but his determination, his perseverance, and his service to the galaxy were attributes that belonged to that of a Jedi Master. Despite Anakin training Ahsoka, the Council wanted to grant him the rank of Master if he was willing to accept it. He was blindsided by this, and he asked why. Mace walked with him, expressing that at Genosis, he had a chance to end the war. He could have killed Dooku, and he left his personal attachment to his friend to get the best of him. Dooku was a mentor of sorts back in the day, but Mace allowed the survival of his former friend to outweigh the need of the galaxy. And despite Anakin not having a connection to Dooku, it was Anakin's determination in making sure there wasn't a single civilian casualty that inspired the Council's decision. It was one that Mace headlined, but he never told Anakin about that. Skywalker made the choice to accept, but then he realized something. All of his time holding back his emotions was in vain, because the Jedi, like any other sentient, were emotional beings. They felt just like him. They may have trained their entire lives to not follow those feelings to control them, but they could feel the same burdens. It changed everything for Anakin, and it was from the last person he ever expected something like this to come from. Mace would leave shortly after. Anakin accepted his ascension within the Order, something Satine heartily congratulated him on. She was proud of him, and those words had a hook on his heart. Having someone be proud of him meant everything. What followed in the week he spent on Mandalore would be an understanding of Satine's place with the Republic. If Anakin had been with Padme, this conversation may have fallen on deaf ears, as Skywalker would have seen it as opposing sides not agreeing rather than something else. But with Satine's outside perspective, he learned so much more of not just the Republic, but Palpatine. It was eye-opening for him, but it didn't turn him against his longtime friend. There was still a slight divide between Anakin and Palpatine. Anakin wasn't mad with this divide either. Satine filled a maternal role for him, and it was left unspoken between the two of them. But there was also something else on his mind. How did Dooku know about their bond? Of course, he could have just guessed, but that seemed like a weird guess to make, especially for Dooku. Skywalker thought on this. He even learned to communicate with Ahsoka about it. She said that perhaps there was someone who told Dooku, but that was the thing. He mentioned it to Obi-Wan and Palpatine and no one else. Why would either of them tell Dooku? Anakin did acknowledge how odd it was though. Maybe it was intercepted communications, but with everything that was said by Satine regarding the Republic and Palpatine's corruption, only for one of the two people who knew about their bond be Palpatine, it kind of made him feel weird about the entire thing. Ahsoka thought Anakin was delving a little too deep into this, but she truthfully could kind of see it. Not in a weird way, but like, it was the only explanation for why Dooku would know. Anakin then had to do something that'd be very uncomfortable. He'd have to bridge the gap between Satine and the Jedi. He couldn't keep this information private, and so he went to the Council, newly appointed Master Anakin Skywalker, requesting their time. The revelation wasn't that hard to swallow. The Council had their own suspicion on Palpatine. The relationship with Satine also wasn't that big of a deal. Ironically, it made Anakin look a bit paranoid from the perspective. As May suggested, Skywalker had already proven that he didn't let his attachment to Satine get in the way of his service for her people. If he thought the Council would care, they wouldn't. The only instance in which it would matter is if Anakin had thrown the Battle of Mandalore to specifically protect Satine. But this wasn't that. With this new information, the Jedi would continue doing deep dives on Palpatine. Anakin's information was relatively convincing for the Council, so why not pursue it? Skywalker felt whole. It was odd. He wasn't speaking to Satine consistently, mostly because she was fighting off Palpatine and the Republic, and he hadn't talked to Padme in a while either. He had found a sense of balance and peace and completion within himself. It was very rewarding. Anakin returned to normal life, fighting on the front lines, hoping something would be done. As the Council continued their investigation, Masters Windu and Fisto engaged Grievous and destroyed him. It was an unexpected fight, but the Siege of Mandalore changed the entirety of the galactic map. Mandalore was right in the middle of a couple hyperspace lanes. The CIS and Republic had to avoid it, but now the Republic was fortifying it, because despite Satine avoiding the Republic like a plague, she was still technically under its jurisdiction now. She was just trying to make a case against it. The neutral systems supported her, but in due time, it wouldn't be worth it. Palpatine had more support and more leverage simply because a Republic military force liberated the planet. Satine was just holding out hope that the war would end 
before they could capture Mandalore. With Dooku and Grievous dead, it seemed inevitable, but then there was something discovered by the Jedi. Palpatine had Sith relics in his office. They'd been tracking him, noticing his weird movements, but chalking them up to normal for him. The Jedi just couldn't find any dirt on him, until finally they realized something. Like, for example, his office was littered with Sith statues. Little red flag! So, they devised a plan, actually, following in Anakin's footsteps with the whole Dooku thing, and they set up the perfect way to dispatch Palpatine. They waited until the war came to a terms of peace, and before the Separatist proposal for peace could be made into the Senate, he was done away with. The Council did it ethically, too. They surprised him, trapped him in carbonite, drained the dark side from him into a Jedi holocron, and then sent him away. It was a bit of a surprise to the Republic when he never returned to office, but the voices from the Senate called for a ceasefire to make sure the chaos of their predicament wouldn't disrupt into more war. The Jedi would begin an investigation on behalf of the Republic to find the culprit behind Palpatine's disappearance, while covering up their own tracks. As the Jedi covered up their own little deception, the galaxy was able to move forward into an era of peace. Anakin continued training Ahsoka through this, and was able to be a support for Satine too. That helped heal some scars he didn't realize he had. Due to not being able to save his own mother, being able to be there for his maternal figure and be supportive of her uplifted his heart. Ahsoka was able to see the transformation of her own master and it was inspiring to her as a student. With the war coming to a close, she was pleased to not be a child soldier anymore. However, despite everything moving into a positive direction, Anakin had one burning question. Did Padme still love him? He wouldn't be able to return to Coruscant until the peace treaty was certified, so when he did return, that was the first place he went. He and Padme were obviously very pleased to see each other, but the first thing he asked was exactly that. Did she still love him? Duh. The best and perhaps most charming part about their separation is it allowed both of them to mature and enjoy taking their time with their relationship. Master Skywalker had no intention of leaving the Order, but he was definitely going to make sure he and Padme got together. Instead of rushing into the marriage like they almost did at the beginning of the war, they would take their time. There was no need to slap a label on everything. They got to just enjoy each other. Anakin had other duties to take care of, such as finishing Ahsoka's training. Padme did too, such as taking care of the Senate. But with the war finally over, they agreed to take things slow and start their relationship again. Four years after the end of the Clone Wars, the Sith were nowhere to be seen. Maul never returned, and Savage remained inside of his home village on Dathomir. The Republic was beginning to return, but it would take time for a golden era to be reborn. Anakin and Padme still hadn't tied the knot yet, but someone else had to. Obi-Wan decided to leave the Order so that he could pursue a life with Satine. After the event on the vessel where she was almost assassinated, he vowed to himself that after the war, he would lead the Jedi and spend his life with her. Of course, if she wanted that. It's exactly what she wanted, and they were now Duchess and Duke Consort. Nothing beat being together after so many years of being apart. And there was an heir to their throne, one that they were both very excited about. By this point, Satine and Anakin referred to each other as mother and son, but Anakin was not the heir that was referred to. Anakin did bring Padme to Sindari, but Satine and Obi-Wan already definitely approved of his choice. Anakin wouldn't ever abandon the Order, as he would come to find the perfect balance between Jedi life and married life. In a few years, once Padme and Anakin were in their 30s, they'd have a son, being named Jin Nibiru Skywalker. He'd be much younger than Satine and Obi-Wan's daughter, but Jin was more than welcome to be in the royal palace with the future Duchess. Ahsoka and Rex would be among the few others that knew about these relationships. Ahsoka's apprentice would also be aware at one point or another too, and it was all accepted. They all rejoiced in the happiness that was now shared between this very large family. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Django Fett, Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalor, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Wus, Xemity, Anakin Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knock, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Zeth Skeleton, Johnny Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kali, Gunless 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forest League, League Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, The Man 3 First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Luke Denwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button. Go check out other things. Links are down below. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So the main frame of reference here is the heroine's journey. I felt that that'd be an interesting way to approach this because the heroine's journey is just 
looped with a lot of emotional changes and I think for a story like has to be like the main priority of the story. If you look at the heroine's journey, the key missing factor in the beginning of it is a disconnect from the feminine, which would be Padme and his mother. And so I wanted the reconnect of the feminine to be with an elder figure and I was it was between Satine and Shakti, and I, I went with Satina's, as you can tell. And so once you get around to the full end of the story, you're supposed to combine both sides, which in this scenario refers to Satine and the Jedi. And so combining both of those allows for the relationship between Padme and Anakin to blossom, but also for him to stay as a Jedi Master inside the Order. So I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.